music, right? Modern music has become very interesting because the mixture with rap, so it's lost a lot of its tonal quality. So it doesn't have the same tonal tonalizations or normal normal kind of stuff they used to have. So it's hey, and there's nobody here. We're all like alone, unarmed and unafraid. Church was a little long. Church was a little long. There's lots of food. Oh well. Temptation. I'll be trickling in with the yeah. sugar buzzes. They should have left the kids out right before communion. That would have helped. Yeah, let them go out. Yeah, yeah. The food would have been gone. Oh well. So I have I have a really easy word for you guys today. L O G I A S. Anti. Logias. Anti logia. It's logic. Something to do with logos? Well, anti. Opposite. Kind of. Yeah. Well, I. So be no logic. Well, not exactly no logic. That'd be dia. Dia logos. Okay. Uh, Diablo, right? right. Dia logos, right? Um, anti logia. We know what logia means, but ante means opposite. So that's right. Whoever said opposite? Opposite of. Logic. Now, okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm not. I don't like this, but the King James and also NIV translates this as contradiction, gainsaying, or strife, antilogia. But we know that the the Greeks would probably say the opposite of logic, right? That's what it means. So it's kind of funny that our translations get us all kind of whacked out in some ways. This one. This is the H-O sound in Greek. Kos. Horkos. Horkos. <coughs> Horkos from a fence akin to horion, horizon. Horios, a bound or limit. Now, this is translated very interestingly as an oath. But specifically, this is a limit. Now, how this is very important to us is... If you remember our word, um, you know, telos, right? A telos, telos. So we have a logos to a telos. And most specifically, the telos is that the, to the vanishing point, right? And it potentially is infinite, right? Until we get a bound, we bound the telos. A horkos is a limit, is the limit, right? And so this is really interesting that it is translated as oath. What, what could you take from that? What might an oath be within this context? I mean, how would you get oath? I, okay, I do think that oath is kind of okay. I, I don't think it's the best translation. You know, what we've done is we've taken a beautiful, logical, reasonable, geometric term, right? And we've turned it into English euphemism. That's exactly what's happened. But you can see why, okay, I, I see why it tells us. And what, what's the other, what's the actual tell us that's a set tell us? Um, is it a paratelos? Uh, Pelotelia? Anyway, there is a set. If you remember, we looked at what is called, it's defined as a commandment, right? A commandment is a set, is a set telos that has only one singular telos. A horkos is a limit, is a little bit different. Because if you remember, okay, if I draw a axis, and then remember, Greeks only have one axis, but we do two axes in in our methodology for mathematics or geometry. So a limit, here's my limit, right? I'm approaching a limit. And there's a little problem with oath because a limit never, never does what? It never touches. It never touches. It touches at infinity. However, well, that's Zio's paradox. Okay, <laughs> this is huge stuff, right? How many of the Greeks knew about Zio's paradox? All of them. Zero's paradox. What is Zero's, Zero's paradox? You, you remember Zero's paradox? 
Zeo's paradox is really important from, uh, for us because, well, hopefully when your geometry teacher taught you geometry, one of the first things they talked about was Zeo's paradox. They probably didn't because they have no clue anymore. But Zeo's paradox says, if okay, I want to walk to those to those things over there. Okay, so I can walk halfway to it, right? And then I can walk halfway to that. I, right? I'll never get there. Because it is a limit equation. What allows me to reach the limit? An unbounded piece, the infinity. What allows me to reach the limit is actually Newton. Because Newton invented algebra, or, uh, integral calculus. And integral calculus says that even though it's an unbounded equation with a limit, there is a physical limit within an unbounded equation. That's what integral calculus is all about. You say, what does that have to do with life? It has a huge amount to do with life because Zeno's paradox is a true paradox, but what, what happens with his paradox? Can I reach those? Yeah, every time. Is Zeno's paradox wrong? Zeno's paradox is not wrong. Is our thinking wrong? No. What the Greeks knew that we forgot until Newton is that, look at their words. A horcos is a limit. It's a bounded limit in an equation, right? They realized about limits, and they realized about a telos, about the concepts that are totally geometrical and they incorporate them, incorporate them within their language. They understood this very well. The thing is, they understood paradoxes as no kidding, real things in the world that did what? That had a real, that philosophically, okay, what am I using when I, when I approach Zeno's paradox? I'm using logic and reasoning, right? What am I doing when I actually go to Athens or reach the beanbag chairs? One of them is logic and reasoning, mathematics. The other one is the real world experience, right? One of them is the scientific method. One of them is mathematics or logic, right? And so we have the three ways to know truth. The Greeks were really smart about this. They would tell you, how do you know truth? I know truth because I have the scientific method. I can repeat it. I can repeatedly go to the beanbag chairs or to, to um, Athens, right? I know it because of the historical method. I was at Athens. I wrote it down. Get it? And I know, uh-oh, in mathematics, what do I have? A paradox. What does this mean that the Greeks thought about the power of logic. If I said, okay, here's the historical method, and here's the scientific method, they'd say they equal each other in its power, right? Then what would they say about logic or reasoning? Is it the same? Less? More? The Greeks would say that logic is just as powerful as this and this. And guess what Newton told us? Guess what Newton showed us? They are. Yes, they are. Newton showed it to us, and finally Immanuel Kant proved, using logic, that God exists. And that's why they hate him. They hate him, they hate him to, to the point of, of, you know, whatever. Anyway, what we take, when we look at this word horcos, let's see it in context. And that's the thing that's beautiful. So I'm, I'm at 15. 15, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to improve my methodology of how we do this. So, I, I have the NIV or the King James Version in, the, uh, uh, in a pure translation, so we don't have to look it up. And it says in 15, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now, if you remember, what were we talking about in 14? I guess I should go back really quickly. I'm not going to re-repeat everything that we've done. 
But in 14, let's see, what were we talking about in 14? If I can find it. Eight. Oh, man. Did I lose it? No 14's in here. Because I cut it off of your, the stuff I gave you today. Uh, 14. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I know what we're talking about. We're talking about the the arguments, and we're talking about the meta epithumia and the epithumia, right? That's what we're talking about: is epithumia and meta epithumia. In other words, we're talking about how does man and God, how do man and God commune, and what is the whole point of of Hebrews? The whole point of Hebrews, the logos and telos of Hebrews, is what allows you. Okay, I haven't used this term before, but I guess we could use it. What allows you to approach God? Jesus Christ, right? And that, by the way, okay, whether you're Greek or Hebrew, all of our group, all of our people, all of our groups, we're in, a, we're in Alexandria. I believe we're in Alexandria. I'm going to stick with that if it's true. So we have the Jews, we have the Greeks, we have the Romans, we have the Egyptians, we have the Jews, Greeks, Romans, Egyptians. That's about all we have. We probably have other Scythians, whatever, kid, what you want. But the big deal is, okay, if I want to approach God, how do each of these groups approach God? Through Jesus. Well, no, yes, through Jesus in the Hebrews concept, but how do they believe religiously, just generally? How does every one of these groups believe that you approach God? Through sacrifice. sacrifice. Yes, through sacrifice is the way you approach God. You can't approach God without sacrifice. Okay. Now, why do you think this was put into the minds of men and women? Okay, now that's a theological concept, but I'm not going to disagree. I think that's why, okay? So each of these groups, now the Jews did it through, we, we talk all the time, the ascension sacrifice, the again sacrifice, the priest sacrifice, and the thanksgiving sacrifice that we still do. Isn't that interesting? How do we approach God? Through? Through Jesus, through the sacrament. Through the sacrifice, right? Well, because our ultimate sacrifice is? What's the meta epithumia? I, I know I'm using the Greek term, but the meta epithumia is Christ, right? That is the in eternal or infinite line between man or God. That's what Hebrew. You know what? That's what Hebrews is all about. That's all Hebrews is about, right? And so all of these groups approach God through sacrifice. And so the the writer of Hebrews is telling us about. Sacrifice. So in 15, okay, here's the translation. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Here's what it really says. Kai, and, Kai is and, so, hoto, after he had patiently endured. No, macrothumia. Not, you know that thing about after he'd been patiently endured? No, waiting patiently, no, macrothumia. The infinite length of the sacrificial smoke from man to God. And, so, the infinite length of the sacrificial smoke from man to God, it's not he obtained, it's epi, epi tuchano. He lit upon, he reached the mark. <clears throat> he reached the mark. Okay, and they say promise. Look at what the word is. It's epangelia. What's epangelia? Good news from the gods. Good news from the gods. And by the way, what's an angelia? Angels. Messengers. Yeah. Again, okay, I'll go back. Remember when we first started looking at Hebrews? And I told you over and over again. At the beginning of Hebrews, they talk about epangelia, and it's all about angels, Right? The messengers are angels. And now all of a sudden, what has happened to the word angels? It's become a promise. Oh my, oh my. Did the translators decide to translate a little bit differently? I want to remind you. Look, God is not mocked. Okay? If I were a translator, I would be really worried. 
about, I guess I am a transcendent. I would be really worried about getting upset, getting God upset. Because here I start Hebrews all about angels and the word from angels. And then what do I do? I turn it into a promise, a message. I'm like, dudes, this is kind of weird, isn't it? Look at what this really says. Here's my translation. And through the infinite length of the sacrificial smoke from man to God, he hit upon the mark to be reached on his, his as in God's announcement. On God's announcement. Isn't that different than, so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised? What is the writer trying to do? What is Hebrews writer trying to do for us in talking about Abraham? What bound Abraham to God? Well, you see, what you have done is, what did you do? You just, you just digested it right and turned it into a euphemism. What does the author literally tell us binds Abraham to God? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. The sacrifice, right? And the sacrifice, because of the sacrifice, he reached the mark or the limit. Do you guys remember? What is the mark or the limit? Hamartia. What's that? Hamartia. Yes, because, well, Hamartia is, is missing the mark, right? What he just said is he just hit the mark. And remember the word. Do you think horkos is in that word? Harmentia, which is, right, the sins, missing the mark, missing the limit. I'm just saying this stuff all fits together. It's not like separate things. So Abraham, because of the infinite length of the sacrifice for man to God, but what was the ultimate promise? Well, I don't like the word promise. What was the message from God, from the gods? What was the message from God? What would be the, what would be, <coughs> okay, so I'm Abraham, right? And the, what connects me to God is this infinite line of the sacrifice. But what is the point of the message of Hebrews about that? Yeah, what's the, what sacrifice? Jesus. Right, it's not the sacrifice of the lamb or the sacrifice of the things, right? Mm -hmm. Those were for, okay, for, or, for shadowing, right? What do we want to say? <laughs> right? It's, it, that's what we do in English. It's a foreshadowing, right? It's a beautiful foreshadowing. And that's what the author is trying to tell us, that Abraham, this, this infinite line. And, okay, what is beautiful about this concept of an infinite line? Is it real? In the picture of the Greeks, what are they showing you? They're showing you a picture, right? A picture that is real to them. Would it be real to you? I think it would be kind of cool. You know, what we do is we have, um, by the way, we do the same thing. We have the eternal flame. That eternal flame should really have... All right, let's put it this way. Okay, any of you guys think back in history. Did any candle before the 21st or, you know, before the middle of the 20th century burn without making smoke? How about kerosene lanterns? Very smoky. Okay, so. Well, they used incense and water yeah. with the yeah. smoke going up. Well, even without incense, but I don't disagree. Keep that in mind. Don't, don't lose that. Don't lose it. But just thinking about it. Until about 70 <coughs> years ago, every candle you lit would make a line of smoke. By the way, why did women, or men, I don't care, but mostly women, why do they not want to light candles in modern houses? It, any, anybody been to an ancient Victorian house that has not been redone? Yeah, they get hot in the summer, too. Well, yeah, but what do you notice about the roofs? They got, they got black soot on them, every one of them. Okay, so every, you know, we have an eternal flame. Oh, and it's, it's so pristine. It's so clean. Natural gas. <laughs> Natural gas. <laughs> well, even gas fixtures. You know, you know what? Gas fixtures were the, were the great 
the great housewife's love, you know, when they invented them. But what did they do? Well, they burned houses, but they, they just made the houses get less sooty, right? So you have less to clean. I'm just saying, we have we are living in an amazing age that we can't even see the macroepithelium. But even so, what you said is right. So if I'm burning, you know, in the temple, they intentionally put, you know, uh, incense or things to, and you do, well, you do the same thing. What do you do at Christmas? That they... Well, you do more than that. You burn, don't you burn frankincense and myrrh? No. <laughs> no. no. You know, okay, the, the, the modern church is becoming too clean for God because in the, in, in the church, what, what do you do with incense on the high holy days? You're supposed to incense the altar and you bring incense in, you know, but we want to be careful, right? We don't want to cause allergies or whatever. So just saying, there, you know, this idea of the macroepithumia, is a beautiful concept that is real, is no kidding real. Every time you lit a fire in the ancient world, any time you had a fire, you were seeing this macroepithumia going up to God. And because the Greeks, and not just the Greeks, we're, we're too sophisticated to really have God, right? Because where does our God live? Well, I don't know, he's someplace. But to the Jews, to the Greeks, to the Romans, to the Egyptians, where was God? In the heavens, right? They had a place. And you know, we say, oh, that's simplistic thinking. But look what the author is doing with this. Okay? And by the way, they were much more sophisticated than that. They knew that God was not like, you know, but they didn't have our realization of space and whatever. So, you know, we're all always learning stuff, you know. In any case, and through the infinite length of the sacrificial smoke from man to God, he hit upon the mark to be reached. The opposite of Hamantia, the, the, not the mark that was missed, but the mark to be reached. On his announcement, that is God's announcement. This doesn't have anything to do with a promise or endurance. It's rather through the sacrifice Adam or Abraham received the announcement of God's plan for... And, you know, we've forgotten about this because this is what we've been talking about. What is the ultimate in Hebrews that we are supposed to enter? We enter the Holy of Holies. Well, enter the Holy of Holies, and that was pictured in that, but we are ultimately entering his Presence. rest. Remember that? Way back, I know. See, I'm, 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 we haven't remembered this because this is a long time ago. We are entering his rest. And remember we had the picture of the Holy of Holies and the church and the temple as being a place of God's rest? Do you remember that? And we had that whole section about rest. And so I know I'm, I'm, bring, I'm, I'm digging it back up because I want you to remember that the whole point of Hebrews is we are going, the whole point in this argument, how do we enter God's rest? And of course we know the answer, we know the punchline is Jesus Christ. But what the author is doing is making a logical argument that appeals to all of these groups to fit that. And so that's when he's talking about this beautiful stuff, macroepithumia. Let's go to 16. And by the way, it continues. Here's what our translation says. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. All right, this gets a little complicated. Um, it's, it says gar. Uh, they translated this gar uh, as for. Gar means in Greek assigning a reason. Assigning a reason. Uh, gar is a philosophical term they use in logical reasoning. So, gar, assigning a reason. Anthropos, men, you know, me, anthropos means men and women. It's, it's the generic term of men. Verily, and okay, here's the word verily is men. Men means affirming a fact. You guys remember? Amen, right? Amen. Amen in Greek is sometimes translated truly, truly. Okay? Men means affirming a fact. Amen is an exclamation affirming that fact. It's, this is a conjective. Uh, it isn't the negative, like A is normally a negative. It is a positive meaning a conjection. So, men, 
It's kind of funny. Affirming effect. Om, om nua. Om nua. Om nua. Om uh, nuo means to swear upon a name. And if you remember, the Egyptians, Rin is the name, right? So it says, assigning a reason, Anthropos, affirming a fact, affirming a fact, swear on a name, uh, kata, by, by the greater, by the larger, and um, ho, ho, horkos, the horkos, a sacred limit or bond, for confirmation, literally, it's not confirmation, it's for bebebos, a foundation. We've had this word before, basis. Uh, bebebos <coughs> means a foundation, a foot. Is is, is added uh, to them, autos, <coughs> the end, paris, the part pierced through, paris, not the end, the part pierced through of pa, all pas, all, that's everything, all, strife. And it's not strife, it's antilogia. I know, this gets a little complicated. Here's the translation I can give you. Assigning a reason, men affirm a fact by swearing on a name larger than their own. And that sacred limit is a foundation for the part pierced through all opposing of a logical argument. I know this makes it a little bit complicated, but, okay, here's what they say. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. That's not exactly what it says in the Greek. <laughs> Assigning a reason, men affirm a fact by swearing on a name, that's pretty close, larger than their own, and that a sacred limit is a foundation for the part pierced through for all that oppose that logical <laughs> argument. All right. What, in this case, would be a sacred limit? Here's the sacrifice. Let's just put a flame here. That's not a really flame. Is it? Let's see. It's a flame. Let me draw a flame. Here's a flame. And a flame lets up. Now, notice how smart the Greeks are. Because this is the macrothumia, right? The macrothumia goes up to God. They realize, however, that it is a <coughs> limit. Why? <coughs> Why is it a limit? Okay. Let's go back to the Greek view of the world. Here's God, <coughs> the plenum of everything, right? But God is external to the creation. Here's the creation, the cosmos. Cosmos. Okay, there's the cosmos. And then within the cosmos is the philosophia. And within the philosophia is what we would call the real world, right? So we have the real world, that which we can perceive. Then we have the philosophia, that which we can know, because we can use logic to see beyond the real. And then we have the created cosmos that outside of philosophia, do we understand it? Nope. And then beyond that we have God. God. So can this literally ever reach God? In a physical sense? Yes. No. No. Never. Right? It can never reach God in a physical sense. Because is God part of the real world? Is he part of the philosophia? He's part of everything, right? Mm -hmm. But it can't physically reach him because he's not contained by it. The Greeks realize this. So the Macrapathumi is going up to a limit. And it, it eventually reaches God. But does it reach God? It doesn't reach God physically. It reaches God within a concept. This is what they would call logic. But even logic can't explain God, right? Because God is outside of philosophia. This is how powerful 
their understanding of it was. Because our understanding, you know, I wish our understanding was even better. We don't teach kids anymore. We don't teach people in colleges or whatever like we should, in my opinion, about these kind of concepts. We've, we've decided that God is dead and therefore we're not going to teach about God anymore. But this is well beyond the idea of angels march, you know, dancing on the head of a pen, right? And yet, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, people are already thinking this way. So, assigning a reason and a firm effect by swearing on a name larger than their own, that's obviously God, and assigning a sacred limit that's a foundation for the part pierced through for all that oppose. In other words, by lighting this fire, this sacrifice, this sacrifice reaches a sacred limit, a horkos. And that sacred limit proves what? Or what does it do? It disproves all anti-logical arguments. And that's the point. So this, uh, the argument of this author, or the writer, writers, is that the sacrifice of Jesus is the sacrifice of Christ, the proven concept, reaches God. Right? Now we say that's, that, you know, we knew that, right? We knew that. Did you know that? Did you really think of it that way? That the, the actual sacrifice of God, of Christ, Reach God. Matter of fact, well, we talked about this in Mark. The early Christians believed that they had sacrificed God. God. If it's God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and you kill the Son, you just kill God. The sacrifice reached God. Hebrews takes a little bit different stand on this, but that's okay. So, this idea of the sacrifice opposes the it's an, it opposes the the anti-logical arguments against it. And so in 17, here's what it says: Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of His purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, He confirmed it with an oath. Here's what it says in the Greek: Wherein it's in hope. Wherein God uh, basically fails, willed, willed. More abundantly, and the word is, okay, perisoteron, to pierce completely through. Now, I'm not sure this is a good, in the, in the previous one we had the word, and, and this is why the Greek is so beautiful. It says, it, they translate it in, but the word is paris. Paris, which means to pierce. A, literally, the, the part that's pierced through. The part that's pierced through, well, let's look. If we have this, this infinite thing going up, what is it piercing through? The limit. Yeah, the limit. And what do I have here? What is the limit? Here's the real world, right? It's piercing through the real world and the philosophical world and the <coughs> cosmos to reach God. God. It's piercing through the cosmos. Now, they don't say it directly, but I think the analog is <coughs> obvious. Because it says, wherein, and, and ho, God will, not more abundantly, parasiterum, literally, to pierce completely through, to show, to pierce completely through, to show unto, which is good, show upon, the heirs, and we've had this before, the kleronomos, right? Kleronomos, the heirs by law, the shares by law, of, not the promise, the Evangelia, the message from the gods, the message from God, the immutability. Um, okay, I don't like the word immutability. It's, it's <coughs> amata thetos, not place amid, not place amid of his counsel, of his purpose, violation of his purpose. Confirmed, he acted as a mediator, not confirmed. It's Messy tail acted as a mediator by a oath, by a sacred limit. Okay, this is kind of complicated. This, this Hebrew is really difficult. Let me give you what my translation has. Wherein God willed to pierce completely through, to show upon the legal sharers 
the announcement not placed amid his violation, his purpose, acted as a mediator with a sacred limit. In other words, what did God do? God... Yes, I, I'll like go with... curtain being torn in two when he died. It seems to you, get through. You, you are precisely correct, but I'll even go further. Okay, this sacrifice... Who made the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Who did it? Well, human beings. We did it, right? We did it, whether we wanted to, whether we thought knew what we were doing or not. I mean, uh, okay, uh-oh. Unintentional sin. Oh, no. We did it. We sacrificed Christ. Okay? Who's reaching for God? We did. Through the sacrifice of Christ, we were reaching God. But this is saying that God himself pierced the sacred limit. What's the sacred limit? God himself, through Christ's death and resurrection, or through his sacrifice, reached down pierced through. This even becomes more obvious. We'll see this in a second. But what he did in the first one is he said, okay, he said, Abraham, the, the message from God to Abraham was that this macro epithumia would reach me, would reach God, right? And then he goes on to say, and God had this macro epithumia that went through the real world, through the through all of this and reached God, right? But then this one says, who reached in? That God, through this action, was reaching in. It wasn't just human action. It wasn't just, well, Christ is God, right? It was the action of God throughout the whole thing. And that's what the author is trying to tell us. Now, let's see. I'll reread this. Wherein God willed to pierce completely through to show upon the legal shares. Who's the legal shares? We are. The announcement not placed amid his purpose acted as a mediator to the... Yeah, well, let's, let's ask this question. What... The announcement not placed amid his purpose. Not placed amid his purpose. Now, I know what we teach ourselves, but did God... Did Jesus Christ... Jesus Christ, I believe, when we looked at Mark, we saw that Jesus Christ, his whole purpose was to die and, and be resurrected. And I think that's very clear, right? But when God created the universe, although he knew, we don't talk about his wills. You have the big will of God. Will the big will of God ever happen? No. It's still not happening. What's God's big will? That everyone be saved. That everyone be saved, right? From demons to to everyone, to the worst of the worst. Will that happen? No. no. God's will, well, I don't know. God's will, according to what we know, will not be done. So God has another will. He has a will of things that he really would like to happen. But do they happen? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. And then there are things that, boy, he has his purpose so when God created the universe, right, he, purpose, he, he, knew, he knew that he would die, right, for these people, these cre creatures he created. He knew it. He knew that, that it would happen, right? Did he want it? No. 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 He wanted us to be good folks and never sin, right? Never be slaves to sin. Oh, it's beautiful, because the pastor was talking about slaves to sin. Never be slaves to sin. Never do anything wrong. Right? But he knew that wasn't going to be possible. And so his purpose, his ultimate purpose at the beginning was, I, I, I don't need, I don't want this, right? Matter of fact, in the beginning, our Old Testament <coughs> tells us that God walked with Adam and Eve, which means, guess what? There wasn't. They weren't the boundaries, yes. These boundaries are kind of obvious philosophically or logically, right? And I think the Greeks were right on when they were kind of espousing these. But the reality was that at the beginning it tells us that God 
was with Adam and Eve. There's no need for a Savior when your Savior is right there, right? But it was because God had to do fix what we screwed up. And this going, you know, okay, we're this is theological. I know I'm, I'm putting my foot in the theological. I'm putting my whole foot in the theological pool right now. But you know, with from the Hebrew standpoint, this is what the guy is trying to show us. But he's doing it not from a Jewish standpoint. What's he doing it from? A Greek standpoint. Like not just a Greek standpoint. The the Greeks, the Jews understood their worldview, right? And so it was. I think it's pretty easy for Paul to come into the Greeks and base or into the Jews and give them this message of hope, right? They had 31 things that if you didn't do them, you're toast. And guess what? None of them could do them because they were diaspora, right? So when when Paul came and said to the Jews, hey, I got an answer for your 31 problems here. And they're like, oh, cool. I love it, right? The problem with the Greeks, though, is he's talking to the Greeks. And what do the Greeks want? They want a logos to tell us that completely explains. And by the way, this picture... And this picture, word picture is really similar to some of Socrates' writings, or the writings about Socrates, especially in the Credo. Anyway, okay, let's go to 18. 18, i got to dig through all my stuff here. Where's 18? Boy, I had a lot of words that I had to translate. Here we go. Um, 18 says, this is NIV, I think it's NIV, maybe King James. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we, have ha we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. All right. That doesn't sound right, does it? Let's see what it really says. <laughs> hina, that. Hina, hina, dia. Hina, dia. That by duo. Two, it's not immutable. Remember we had this word in the last, we had this word in the last uh, verse, the last sentence. It was, um, uh, where is it? A metathetos, or a form of that. A metathetos. Let's see, what is that? That was in, we're in 18, this one's 17. If you look down there, it says, um, uh, <laughs> A metathetos, not placed amid. It was translated immutability. Okay? And again, it's translated immutable. It means not placed amid. That by two, not placed amid deeds, not things, it's pragma, deeds, in which um, it says, okay, which it was impossible, that's okay, not able, adjuntos, for God, okay, to Sodomia, to utter an untruth. So that's pretty close. But Theos, to not utter an untruth. We might have, uh, see, uh, literally hold, okay, a forceful, Iskeros, forceful, paraclesis. Okay, paraclesis. We haven't had a paraclesis in a long time, right? Paraclesis. Anybody remember this one? What's para? No. Near? Clesis. Okay, it is translated Holy Spirit in some places, but Paraclesis is a little bit more complicated than that. As a matter of fact, we know this. Paraclesis near <coughs> calling, near calling. Cleo, remember Cleo? Paracleo, Paraclesis. This is near calling. As a matter of fact, what's okay? I got to I got to make my brain. Uh, I don't have it written down. Um, ecclesia, ecclesia. What are we? We're the ecclesia, right? The church, the Athenian democracy is called the ecclesia because it is those who are called. So why did they take the word and turn it into consolation? Because it's paraclesis, near call, who ho have fled, um, basically cataphago, which is flee down, which is good, for refuge, uh, that's added. Uh, the for refuge is added. To lay hold upon, literally, kreto, to use strength, the elpis. Elpis is translated hope. 
But you notice I put a better word in there to anticipate. Anticipate is a better Greek word for elpis. Set before, literally, prokemia, for lies, us. Lays before us. Okay, here's the translation. That which by two not place amid deeds, not able for God to utter an untruth, hold a forceful near call, who flee, who flee down to use strength to anticipate that which lies to the fore. Okay, I know this gets a little bit complicated, but we're talking about, we're talking about, the first one is about the sacrifice of Christ reaching up to God. Literally, man's sacrificing of Christ is that macrothumia that reaches to God. Then the next one, it talks about God reaching down to us. And then this is telling us, so which are the two not place amids? The two not place amids are man reaching up, or the macrothumia reaching up, and the God reaching down, right? Those. Why aren't they amid? They're not amid, why? What are they not amid? God's free will. Well, because he wasn't, he didn't will that we'd have a broken relationship that would have to be you could go with that, but let's let's look at it physically. Let's look at a physical diagram. If it's a mid, what does that mean? It, it won't reach, right? It, it's a limit. It to, to, re to reach a limit, you have to do what? You have to break the paradox. Zeno's paradox says I can't ever get to Athens, right? I can't ever get someplace. But the that's the paradox. So the paradox here is... How can anything that is real, like a sacrifice, reach God? Or the other question is, how can God reach us? You see? This is a really important concept to them. That which the two not place amid deeds. The two not place amid deeds is God reaching down and the sacrifice reaching up. Not able for God to utter untruth. Okay, in other words... God had told Abraham what? That there would be a Messiah that would come from him. Well, that his, his metapathumia, right. right, which is foreshadowed by Christ. You're, you're skipping ahead quite nicely, but you're right on. You know, he told Abraham. Now, in, in this point, he said specifically Abraham, the metapathumia, the sacrifice, the evangelia, the message from God was that that sacrifice would eventually reach him. Right? Beyond the bounds of the limit. And so through Christ, it did. Right? That's the message. Now this goes back and it says, so God couldn't utter an untruth. And the, and the truth was what he told in the Evangelion. And by the way, that's what the whole of this book is about. Right? At the very beginning, it starts with the Evangelia. And, and our translators translated, the angels. And the message of the angels. And I'm like, dudes, this is a message of God. God Almighty is telling you something. And you make it, oh, the angels, and this is so cute. And then we get deep into this logos, and it's using these terms over and over again. I'm not making, I am making fun of the translators. I wish they would figure out that this stuff is not, I, I was talking to Tammy the other day, and, and we said, you know, we have deluded Christ to be some weak Thing, you know, of uh, that is just so wimpy, right? When we're talking about the Almighty God of creation, look at these logical arguments that are produced by his followers. And this isn't what we, we decided this book was probably around the time of the temple, you know, at least the temple's destruction. So by 90 AD, they're extorting a logical argument that is fully cogent. Mm -hmm. To the people around them. Because did people come to know Christ or come to accept this pistis because of this? Did it work? Yes. We know it worked. Because otherwise we wouldn't have it. There are 44, there are 44 known gospels. Of them, only like 6 or 10 are extant, right? How many other works were written about this period? numerous ones. Many of them we know about, many of them we don't have. But why did some stand and some didn't? Because they were historically accurate and because they worked. Exactly. This stuff is just beautiful stuff. 
That, okay, so, God entered in it and, and uttered, did not utter untruth, and the near call to flee down to use force to anticipate that which lies to the fore. What's a near call? Good Lutherans would tell us, matter of fact, the par paraclesia, we, as Judy told us, we translate that as Holy Spirit, which is not really a great translation. Usually when they translate Holy Spirit, they translate it as a comforter, right? But here they translate it as a consolation. But it's not that at all. It's the near call. Remember I talked to you about paraclesia before, and I said the Greek view of the, of the, of the paraclesia, the paracleo, is like a mother. Your mother calls you. She says, get in here right now. And you know what's going to happen. Right? Your mother calls you and says, come to dinner. Or come here, honey. Right? But you know, in the Greek worldview, and this is probably our worldview too, I hope, a mother's chiding love, right? Because she spanked, I hope she spanks you still. She spanks you because you broke her laws or her rules, right? And yet, what does she do? Well, yeah, she holds you in her arms and loves you. Well, she may not forgive you, but at least, you know, when you when you break her, her favorite vase, she may not forgive you, but at least she loves you, right? I know your mothers are thinking, you know, the fathers too, you know. You know that your kid did something, and you're like, I'm never going to forget that. I'm never, you know, you may have said, oh, I'm going to, I forgive you, but no, you never did. You're just, oh, uh, you know, when he took your brand new car, right, and, and he run into something, it's like, yeah, I forgive you. No, you never really, for, you never forgot that, right? Love the sinner, hate the sin. Just saying, just saying, you know, because we're all human, right? We're all, we all have that issue. Just saying. I, I don't think we're supposed to forget our sins. Because if you forget your sins, you'll do it again. You'll do it again. I think this idea about forgetting sins is kind of a... God may forgive your, forget your sins, but you're not supposed to forget them because that's your educational process, right? Just saying. 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Okay, here we go. This, you said it, but this is where we are. We have, we have this hope is added, okay? We have this hope is added. Literally it says, as an anchor, an anchor, ag kura, anchor. And this is a great Greek word because the Greeks had ships yeah. like crazy. Yeah, the Athenian Greeks, they beat the Persians and a bunch of other, and the Romans a couple of times too. For the, oh, it's not soul, it's suke, suke. Now, this is really interesting, isn't it? Well, I just think it's because we fail to understand. I'm reading, a, I read a really cool older book, right? And it talked about kids' education, and it talked about teaching the body, the mind, and the soul or spirit, right? And I'm thinking today... What do we teach our children? But that's okay. We have this hope added as an anchor. An anchor, a kura for the suke, for the mind and thoughts. Firm, it's not firm, it's astalis, which means not fail. And bibos, like a foundation. Didn't we just hear this about a foundation, right? A foundation? It enters, literally, come into, er shomai, what's come into? The inner sanctuary, the interior Behind is added the kata petasama, the, the down-flying veil. Now you say, what is this down-flying veil? You know what it is. You told us. The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies and the temple, which is symbolic of our separation from God. Yeah. The, well, the, just, okay, let's take the Greek word, right? The Greek word, this is a word that's used in Matthew, and the word that's used in the New Testament, everywhere it's used in the New Testament and the Apocrypha, it means the veil in the temple between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. All right? So remember, the picture, right? I'm running out of space. Let's see a picture. I do a picture. 
So here's, here's the Holy of Holies, and here's the veil, right? And here's the door. And then I have the altar, right? And so once a year, once a year, the priest brings, it, brings in the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. All right, think about this. Think about this, what this writer is writing about. The sacrifice reaching from man to God, God reaching from God to man, and now we're talking about the veil, right, being split. In other words, this is a symbol, a beautiful well, symbol. The Greeks didn't have a symbol. It's a concrete imagery of that lack of separation. It's beautiful. So we think. talk about, actually, in modern times, we talk about, like, the veil between, you know, like, life and death or here and heaven or whatever. It, we still have that, that picture. I don't disagree. I think, yeah. Think about these, how these images, especially within English constructs. Thank you, Father, for your word. Pray you look after us this week. You name we pray. Today we use lasers. We use lasers? <laughs>